Baptist Church. Uh, it's, a, it's good to be in the Lord's house today and uh, to see the, his faithful here, family and friends here today uh, for Thanksgiving. Uh, we welcome Hannah's parents in today from uh, the Lone Star State, come all the way from Texas uh, to hear me preach. Oh, no, not really. <laughs> But anyways, what a blessing uh, you guys are uh, to see you and to meet you finally. Um, I want to share a couple things first. Um, uh, re reference to Christmas Eve service, uh, Pastor, Ka uh, Pastor Jamie has sent out a questionnaire to the parents. We would like to have as many people in, in uh, the sanctuary as possible so that if you're interested in having your children um, maybe willing to be downstairs and have a different program presented to them, uh, it'll be a message obviously uh, for the younger, younger children. Uh, get with Pastor uh, Jamie about that. I think he sent out a notification. The other thing is we will not we will not be starting um, one service uh, starting in January. We're going we're monitoring the situation, and uh, so we will let you know within two weeks when we plan on doing it. So we will never shut our doors. I want you to hear that from your pastor. Uh, the word will be preached from here. You come as you feel led to come, and uh, we will be continuing with the two services come. January. Uh, I want to speak a, a moment uh, that kind of sets everything up what uh, Pastor Cal uh, shared with you this morning out of Psalms 27. Uh, we came here this morning. It's amazing how God does his thing uh, for me. Um, and as you get the time to meditate on uh, Psalm 27 this week, I would ask you to do that and think of it in light of what we're going to be talking about today. And also the, in light of the fear that you may have uh, in life. Um, I just remind you again uh, what Pastor Cal read. The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Folks, that's a great question to ask this morning. As uh, we get back into the Gospel of Matthew, what, what are you afraid of? I've titled this serving Living Faith. So is your living faith, does it cast out your fear? Your shepherd to instruct you and to uh, correct you where necessary in the Word of God. And um, not to give my personal opinion uh, about things, but to tell you what God's Word has to say. And, and uh, I've really enjoyed yesterday morning with, with the men as we had our uh, discussion in Romans 12. But one of the things I've noticed in, as I have the men come and then the women come every other week is that my hunger and desire is to see people grow but the, as Romans 12 Christians. But the ones that are already growing as Romans 12 are the ones that are coming both men and women. The struggle I have is those men and women who aren't coming to the Romans 12 and they're struggling in their walks, in their lives. And, and I, I just want to, what an encouragement it is. I tell the men on Monday night, there is no rather place I'd rather be on Monday nights, including being home with my wife, <laughs> that I'd rather be on Monday nights than be here with the men. And, and why, do I, why do I enjoy that so much? Because I hear the heart of the men of this church. I see their struggles. I, I, I hear them open up to 18 to 19 men and, and talk about real life issues and, and how the Bible can help us deal with those issues. We live in trying times. And when you're out there on your own on an island, you're out there alone on an island. And everything looks worse when you're by yourself. Everything looks worse. You start to fret. You start to worry. Everything is compounded. It's amazing when you get around the people of God and you know, in spite of what's going on, they start talking about what God is doing in their lives. It's an encouragement. And it should be. Because the Bible tells us we mourn with those who mourn in Romans 12. Uh, we grieve with those who grieve and we rejoice with those who rejoice. And this morning, uh, we're going to walk into a passage of Scripture. Turn in your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 9, which kind of just uh, expands on everything I've just introduced to you to this passage Matthew chapter 9 verse 18 through 26 before we get there I want to make some opening comments about death because each of us inherit Adam's sin each of us is cursed with the result of that sin which is death death is the enemy of every one of us from your pastor standing here to the smallest baby downstairs unless the Lord comes to take his church home we will die and death is not pretty. Death is not a pretty sight. If you've been there at the death of a loved one who's passed on, it's not pretty to watch them die. I have seen too much death in my life. I have seen family slaughtered by a husband who committed 
suicide, but before he did that, he murdered his wife and three children. I've seen that. I've been there when, when uh, uh, I've seen uh, death and, uh, at, at an accident scene or death at a robbery or, or other homicides. I, I've seen that and witnessed that, and it's not pretty. It's never pretty. You, you, you try to comfort those innocent victims. You, 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 you try to explain it, but we cannot explain death away other than it's a result of sin. We have managed to pro prolong life in the 21st century because of medical advances, overcoming many of the diseases, and even we have even organ transplants. I still remember back in the 70s, right down at MCV, and I know they don't call it MCV anymore, just like they don't call it VEPCO anymore, but I still call it VEPCO and MCV. But MCV, which is a different name now, like VCU Medical Center, I think, um, they had the first heart transplant back in the 70s. And I was like, man, they can do that? And you see how far that has come now, where they do lung. My daughter-in-law, uh, who was married to my son um, before she died, she had, a, she had cystic fibrosis, and she even had a lung transplant to extend her life for a period of time. But... Even though we've managed to do all this, we still cannot cheat death. Matter of fact, did you know that before the eradication of smallpox, in the, that it killed 33% of those it infected? It had a mortality rate of 33%. Out of every 100 people that contracted smallpox, 33 people died. Over 300 million people died of smallpox in the 20th century before a vaccine was invented think about that and how blessed we are that God has allowed those kind of advances. Without modern advances in medicine, my children would not be alive today. Would not be here. Nobody on that front row would be sitting there today. My wife had a ruptured appendix when she was pregnant with my daughter. If penicillin had not been invented in 1928, my wife would have died from a ruptured appendix. Now, they did find out during this research that they actually did uh, appendicitis appendectomies, is that what it's called? Is that correct? For, for appendicitis? They actually did those in the late 1700s. Could you imagine how fun that must have been? <laughs> but it wasn't until that they developed that uh, simple penicillin that, that people who died of just uh, infections. And that was, I want to give credit where credit's due, just for you history buffs out there. It was Alexander Fleming, and he did it at St. Mary's Hospital in London in 1928. Modern medicine may be able to cheat death for a short time, but death inevitably wins the game. It's a chess game that you will never win. You can never win against death. It will defeat us once and for all, except if you belong to Christ. And if you belong to Christ, you can say, Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, death, where is your victory? Because even though we may die the physical death, we do not die the second death, and God saves us. You know, death takes some, some early, as we have our own, own members who have lost, uh, lost a child at birth. We have lost people who have died in their prime. Many of you have not been here uh, when we had a woman who lived in, this, lived in our county, visited our church, I met with her a, uh, a, a 10 days before her death. Um, she came to me, professed Christ as Savior, and uh, she was a, a grandmother, professed Christ as Savior, joined the church, and was murdered the next week. We have experienced those things here in our own church. Death of infants, death of, of what some would say are the innocent. And death is the persistent enemy who will eventually win. But many false religions have doctrines developed to try to satisfy, satisfy man's desire to cope with death by some means. The terrible tragedy is that the hope given by false religions is not hope at all. There is no hope in them. Secular humanism dismisses death as just part of a, the evolutionary process. But that leads uh, to a life of cynicism, despair. And of life of no purpose. I can remember when I was serving papers one time on a Sunday. It was a Sunday morning. I was serving papers and I went to an affluent neighbor off of Robius Road neighborhood. And I, went and I, I met this man who came to the door as I was serving a, a summons. Not a warrant for arrest, but just a summons. And he came and he, and he was just looked discouraged. And I said, uh, sir, are you so-and-so? He said, yes, I am. I said, I have this. He says, it, it doesn't matter. 
He said, I have a death sentence. I have cancer. I'll be dead in six months. And I remember the despair this man had. Just the, the utter hopelessness that this man had. I can tell you this. If you're alive when this pastor dies, if you come and, and to comfort my wife and my children at that passing, you will know one thing, that when I died, I, I did not die without hope. That I live my life in hope, knowing that Christ is the one who saved me. And death is not to be feared. It, don't get me wrong. We will, death is ugly. But it is nothing to be feared. You know, 15 years before he died, Mahatma Gandhi wrote this. I want you to put this in context. I'm going to give you two, two different dates. 15 years before he died, he wrote this. I must tell you in all humility that Hinduism, and I know it entirely satisfies my soul. It fills my whole being, and I find solace in the Bhagavad. And, and, uh, and the Upanishad, I guess those are two holy books that they have. And then I miss even that I miss even in the Sermon on the Mount. Because if you know Mahatma Gandhi, he praised the Sermon on the Mount. But this is what he said just before he died. Fast forward 15 years. My days are numbered. I am not likely to live very long, perhaps a year or a little more. For the first time in 50 years, I find myself in the slew of despondent. What happened to his faith in Hinduism? It left him because he had no faith. He had no hope. See, there are really two questions that man has regards to death. Only two. Has anyone ever conquered it? And did that person make a way for me to conquer it? Has anybody conquered death? And is there a way for me to conquer death? In our text this morning, we find that, that Jesus both conquered it and made a way for us to conquer it as well. Jesus has authority over death. If you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word here this morning, Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 18. While he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus rode and followed him with his disciples and behold a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment for she said to herself if I only touch his garment I will be made well and Jesus turned and seeing her he said take heart daughter for your faith has made you well and instantly the woman was made well and when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion he said go away for the girl, girl is not dead but sleeping and they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl rose. And the report of this went through all that district. Father, we come this morning to worship you. We have sung praises to your name. We have given of our first fruits. And Father, now we come to hear the proclamation of your word. We have heard you speak audibly to us through the written word that we have, I have just repeated to your flock. I pray as a mere man stands before your people, Lord, that the preaching of your word would be a comfort, that it would encourage where it needs to be, encouragement needs to be, where it will heal where healing needs to take place. Father, it will correct where correction needs to be taken place. I pray for the one who does not know you as Savior, Lord, the one who would die today would, would ultimately spend eternity away from you, the one who fears death today because they do not know you or your son, I pray, God, that you would bring them to saving faith. In Jesus' precious holy name, amen. So, as we look at this passage here today, you may, you may see two stories, and there are two stories here. And they may seemingly be different stories, and why are they told together in these verses? There's two different stories, and they're told in the same verses. The, they both involve females. One, uh, uh, a young girl or a, excuse me, an older girl and a young woman. Why do I say uh, a young woman? Because in the days of Christ, this 12-year-old girl would have been a woman. She would have been eligible to be married. I want you to think about that. I think about that hard when I look at my granddaughter sitting on the front pew, front seat here, and she's 11 years old, and I'm thinking, 
any boy comes close to my granddaughter at 12 years old, I'm going to have a problem with that. But, but, we, but put it in historical content, and, uh, and I know that some of you daddies are thinking, Pastor, why did you even say that today? But um, in the historical content, this was a, a young woman. This was a, a considered in Jewish. Remember, a, a, a boy became a man at age 15. They just kind of said, you're a man, you're a woman. And that's why uh, scholars, biblical scholars will say that um, Mary was probably around 13 years old, between 13 and 15, when she had Jesus. Very, very young. And so, as we look at this passage today, and we see this one of the young, wo wo young girl, uh, young woman, and then we have a grown woman. And yet, if you think carefully about what Matthew and the other Gospels tell us about them, you'll see that there are some remarkable similarities between both of them. Aside from the, back, the fact that both are the stories of females, we see that both of them are called daughters. Both of these participants here, these women, are called daughters. The word is one that is, has an affectionate feel to it. It's one of, of love and uh, uh, and deep affection. So, and so the man tells Jesus here, my daughter has just died. I want you to understand something. This could be translated better um, uh, that, that the, the child is near death because the gospel writers in Mark and Luke tell us that she has not died yet. And so this child is near death. And when we read Mark's and Luke's telling of the story that the girl was only 12 years old, but we read that the woman had an ailment of 12 years. So here's a 12-year-old girl and a woman who has been bleeding for 12 years, the same amount of time that this young girl was alive. Both stories involve sickness, and both of the sufferers were in need of Jesus, both of them. Mark tells us that when the man came to Jesus, he said, My little daughter lies at the point of death. And similarly, Mark also tells us that this woman had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. But those both stories involve severe suffering. Both stories are, uh, give us an example of deep faith. And I want you to think about that this morning as I proceed through this sermon. Does your living faith cast out fear? This morning, I'd like us to look at these two stories in great detail. God has chosen to weave these two stories into one so that a very important lesson that we can be taught and we can learn about the way Jesus works in our lives. So this morning, I want us to look at the three participants of this story. We have the leader, Jairus, whose daughter is suffering. And then we have the lady of the, of the blood disorder for 12 years. And then we have the laughers, the scorners, when Jesus finally shows up at Jairus' home. Look with me at the leaders first, the leader first. Look at verses 18 and 19 of today's gospel in Matthew chapter 9. While he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died near death, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. As I said before, and for those who are taking notes, you can read the, in greater detail the story in Luke chapter 8, verse 40 through 56, and Mark chapter 5, verse 22 through 43. Those two tell this story in the other synoptic gospels. Jesus had been speaking to the disciples of John the Baptist. Remember that? Remember that uh, he, from last week's sermon, that John the Baptist's disciples were curious of why Jesus was and his followers were not fasting. Their leader, their, their, the, the John had been placed in prison and they couldn't understand uh, the fact that Jesus still uh, was eating and, and uh, that his disciples ate and he, he said look the, it's not time for them to grieve and to mourn as you are it's the bride groom is here and his friends don't, don't mourn when he's here and so Jesus has just got finished doing that and then we see this ruler show up and he asks and, and he comes to Jesus and who was this ruler? 
Who, who was this fellow? Well, the other gospel writers tell us that his name was Jairus and that he was a very important and very respected man within the community. He was the ruler of the synagogue of that region. Many of you know the synagogue is and was the place that Jewish people gathered for worship and regular religious instruction. And the ruler of the synagogue was the man who had been chosen by the elders of the synagogue to oversee its operations. We would better understand it as the senior pastor. There's an interesting story in the Gospel of Luke that gives us some insight into the role of this ruler of the synagogue. Jesus had healed a cripple. Many of you remember that story. He, and, uh, he healed this woman in the synagogue during the Sabbath, and immediately the woman began to glorify God. But, but the ruler, this different ruler of the synagogue, was upset. And he stood up in front of the whole church, the whole synagogue, the whole crowd, and said, there are six days of which men ought to work, therefore come and be healed on them, and not on the Sabbath day. As Jesus set the ruler straight and proved him to be a hypocrite back in Luke chapter 13, but it just shows you how important this man was to be able to stand up in a synagogue and address what he thought was heresy. It was his job to make sure, the ruler, that things were done decently and in order and in full accord with the teachings of the Scripture. And that makes it even more remarkable that this ruler, this man, would come, Jairus would come, and he came to Jesus in the way he did. Remember, it was already started the divide between the religious leaders and Jesus. They already didn't like what he was doing. Remember two weeks ago in the sermon when, when the Pharisees were thinking to themselves, why is he eat with sinners? They already started to despise this man. And so it says that he, that he in verse 18, we see that he comes and he worships him. In Luke chapter 8, tells us he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to the house. I explained this in great detail when even the demons, remember when they were cast out of those two men and the demons fell before Jesus and worshipped him? They, it wasn't because they worshipped him because they loved him. They understood who he was and acknowledged him as the Son of God. But here you have a man that humbly comes before Jesus and acknowledges who he is. And for the ruler of this synagogue to bow down to Jesus and pay homage to him in this way, was a tremendous testimony to this man's faith. Clearly, he had heard of the things that Jesus had been doing. Let me stop for a moment and ask you, how, what's your attitude towards Christ this morning? You know all the stories in the New Testament. You know how the Old Testament plays out. You know how uh, the end will play out, how the book of Revelation plays out. I, I always... I kind of chuckle every time I hear people talk about global warming. Have you read the book? you realize what's going to happen? And, 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 and so I ask you this morning, this man obviously recognized who Jesus was. You have so much more information than he does. Do you worship him? Do you acknowledge what he's done in your life? Do you wait with anticipation of what he's going to do in your life? Do you know and understand that He will answer prayers that you ask Him? You may not get the answer that you want, but that He will. And see, this man clearly had heard of the things that Jesus had been doing and the act of reverence before Jesus now indicated the kind of conclusion He came to concerning the things He had heard. You understand, when you have saving faith, you can't help but worship God. When you have saving faith, you can't help but give Jesus the glory that He deserves. When you come here on a Sunday morning, you come to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's not about you. It's not about this preacher. It's not about the musicians. It's not about the singers. It's not about anything but Christ. And this man recognized Jesus. He was pleading earnestly with Jesus to come to his home and lay his hand on his young daughter. Men, what would you not do if you had the opportunity to save your child? He would do anything. And this man goes to the one he knows can do. He said, my daughter has just died. And again, the more literal translation, my daughter has just come to the end of her life. He's pleading. She's going to die. But come and lay your hand on her and she will live. That faith. He has that faith to know that Jesus will do what he can do. 
He can only say this because he believed the things that he'd been hearing about the man Jesus, that he truly was the Son of God. You see, he believed. He believed in Jesus. What say you this morning, Christian? Do you, you profess Christ as Savior? You belong to Him, but do you live your life like everything is just, well, maybe things happen by chance? Maybe God intervenes? You know, this morning I, uh, I shared with the first um, service, and I, I was just moved by this story Jesse Royal told me this week, one of the elders here at the church about God's sovereignty and grace in the midst of potential tragedy. And many of you who know Jesse, you know what could happen at his place when it comes to the story I'm getting ready to tell you. Last week, his grandchildren were over and some friends were over and they were playing in a playhouse. And as they were playing in the playhouse, it's one of those ones that's probably six feet, eight feet above the ground. And one of his granddaughters falls out onto the ground. And as little children do, you know, everything is a little bit excited. You know, they get a little bit more excited. Once you find out they're not dying, you, you, you calm down. But everybody came out of the treehouse. Everybody. All the kids came out of the treehouse. Minutes later, a dead tree fell on that treehouse. If that child had not fallen out of that tree, um, fallen out of that treehouse, Four or five or six children would have been inside that and struck by a tree about that big. If you don't know this, Jesse Royal's son was paralyzed by a fallen tree on that property when he was just a boy. And you think of God's providence and God's sovereignty. When we look at a God who can control things like that, we say, blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And so we, we, we can say as Christians, we can recognize, I know some scoffers are sitting here this morning even thinking, well, you know, that's just pure luck. Well, folks, we Christians don't believe in luck. There's no such thing as luck. I hate it when I hear Christians say luck. I don't hate you. I hate the word. <laughs> because luck doesn't, ha there's no place for it in a Christian's life. It doesn't have anything to do with luck. It's God's sovereignty and His grace. See, this man believed, just as you believe. Now just consider the man's faith, and what he said, but come and lay your hand on it, and her, and she will live. She will live. Where would he have gotten such an idea from? Where would such a conviction have come from? I believe that God gave him this conviction, obviously, but he would have heard it from heard about Jesus mercy in the community he would have he would have heard how Jesus cured the leper of the leprosy he would have heard how the centurion's faith had saved the young slave he would have heard how Jesus touched uh, Peter's mother-in-law he would have heard about the demons being cast out he would have heard about the control of the weather and stopping nature. He would have heard all these things. He would have heard about Jesus forgiving the sins of the man who was paralyzed and telling him to get up and walk. He would have heard all these things and believed. You see the difference was God gave him the faith to believe. It's by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone that we believe. And this man, why did others, why were others blinded but this man believed? Why are some of your friends, some of your neighbors so blinded that you pick up the Word of God, you read the Word of God, and it is so clear to you. It's, it's such a clear understanding. It's because God has removed the veil from your eyes and the scales from your eyes, and you who were once in darkness now are in light and can fully understand the Scriptures of God. And so this man believed. And with that faith, he comes to Jesus. He was convinced that if Jesus would just come, it would be all right. And look at the great mercy of our Savior. Look, look, look at our, the great mercy. He, he never turns away anyone who comes to Him with such faith. Every scripture that we see, every story we see in Scripture, you never see Jesus turn away those who are faithful. He doesn't chase down the unfaithful, though, does He? Come, 
follow me. I can't do that. I, I've, I've got to bury my dad. No, I can't do that. I'm too rich <laughs> to give up everything to follow you. And Jesus doesn't chase after those, but those who come to him in faith, he's there. He's there for you this morning. You don't know him as Lord and Savior if, if you're right now, you're in a place where you've heard the gospel. You understand that you understand all the words that I've said before or some other preacher has said or a friend or neighbor has told you. You may have, even be a member of a church and you're sitting here, a member of this church is sitting this morning. But you've truly n- never come to that place where you recognize in yourself that you're a sinner and that you need a Savior. See, that's, that's the bottom line. The difference between the two thieves, both of them were sinners. Both of them were wicked, but the one recognized his sin, recognized that he could do nothing to save himself. And he, and, he, and he acknowledges that sin, and then he acknowledges Jesus as Lord, and guess what happened? The most tragic day in that man's life became the most triumphant day in that man's life. Because that day, that day, he was with Jesus in paradise. You think about that for a moment. The fear of that man it must, and the Holy Spirit that entered him at that point and he was free, the free from the ravages of sin. So Jesus goes with this man to save his daughter and to meet this great need. But as often happens in life, one story goes and another one begins. And God's providence and in accordance with his plan of, for good these two stories now intersect for his glory. Jesus is going to get ready to be interrupted. Jesus is going to be interrupted. So what say you, Christian? Do you come to God in prayer believing he will answer as this man did? Do you come to the Lord believing that a prayer will be answered? Do you have the faith to know that you will seek God's will? So God, this is what I desire. This is my heart's desire. And this heart's desire aligns with your will. God, I desire my faith to increase. You pray that prayer. You pray for God to give you wisdom. The Bible tells you to. The Bible says seek Him and you will find Him. As we seek His will in our life, I'm not telling you, hey God, I really, really want that new Mercedes Benz. And I think it would look really pretty in my driveway. That's what we're talking about here. We're not talking about that. What we're talking about is I seek and plead for God's will. Lord, bring those that I love to saving faith. That's my first and most heartfelt prayer that I start the day with every day. Lord, bring those that I love to saving faith. Because right now, if they died in their sins, they would spend eternity apart from them. And see, this, in Christian, so when you pray, are, do you have this faith? Knowing that God will answer? Either their faith is like the leper... Or faith on the behalf uh, on the behalf of others, like the centurion, the faith of the leper. He believed he would be healed, and if God chose to, he could heal him. See, we need to have the same attitude as Shadrach, Meshach, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We need to have that same attitude that our God can save us. As they're getting ready to get thrown in the fiery furnace, that God can save us. Oh, great King! Guys, getting ready to assassinate him, kill him. Kill them for, their, for the sake of God. And they're still acknowledging this guy as their king. You have the right to do with us as you will. Their bodies. But our God can't save us. But if he doesn't save us, guess what, king? He's still our God. God chose to save them. Folks, do you have that in your life? Do you live your life knowing that, that, that God can save you? He can put you in a place where you can avoid anything that's going on around you? And if he chooses to do that, praise God. But if he chooses not to, if he puts you in the heat of the battle, what, what say you? What say you? And do you know that God will give you the desires of your heart if they line up with his will? <laughs> some, some people don't understand this. That Well, my desire is this. You know, I can remember when my wife broke up with me. And it's hard to believe she would ever do that. When we were kids. That we were going steady. That's what you did back then. You went steady. You gave a high school ring out. And she was yours for life. Even if you were in high school. And I remember she, she broke up with me. Went with somebody else. And I was crushed. But then I started dating somebody else. And I'm thinking. I ain't doing so bad for myself. I get to date all these girls now. Back in that day. Girls didn't ask guys out. I don't know what it's like now. But back then. They just sat by the phone. And waited for some guy to call. 
Well, I was the guy, so I didn't have to wait. So I was in there calling and talking to different people. And I, I'm thinking to myself, I am so glad that God saved her for me. I'm so glad that I didn't get the desires from my heart when I was 17 years old. Aren't you men? Aren't some of you men glad? And I look back and think of all the things that God has saved me from in my life. All the heartaches and, and tragedies. And in the midst of the, the heartaches that I have had, I've had peace knowing that God's still in control. When we lost, we, Kath and I have six children, when we lost our baby at birth, I can remember weeping and mourning, but I wasn't mourning as one with no hope. I was, I was, I was grateful that my God had allowed us to even have this child. And I will see her one day. I believe that with all my heart. I will see my Rachel. And I will sing praises to my God and my King. And remember, this life is nothing but a moment. Not even a moment in eternity's sake. And yet some of us cling so much to this world, we are so afraid of dying that we don't live for Christ. God has come to set us free. Jesus came to set us free. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. He doesn't cause you to live in fear and anxiety and everything else. We should be the most happy people on the face of the earth. We should be the most uh, people that enjoy life to its fullest, knowing that God is in control, no matter what our circumstances. And so that brings us to the lady. So we, we've seen the... We've seen the leader. Now let's look at the leader. Look at verse 20. And behold, a woman who has suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years came up and behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to herself, if only I touch his garment, I will be made well. And Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. So he's interrupted. He's, he's, he's on his way to, to Jairus' daughter, to his house to heal her. And then we come to this interruption. And so imagine if you were the daddy right now. Imagine that's your child. You wouldn't be too excited about Jesus stopping for anybody. I, 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 come on, Jesus, let's go. We got to go. We got to go. And yet, Jesus stops here. We see in the verses the faith of the lady with the issue of blood. So turn with me to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke. This morning I read out the wrong gospel and everybody's sitting there trying to look for it in Mark and I, and they're, I could see them all going, oh, I messed up. Luke, the gospel of Luke, chapter 8, verse 43. Luke, chapter 8, verse 43. And here we're going to see uh, a different retelling. Again, remember what I've told you before. This is a different witness now. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years, and though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, Who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and, you're, and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I perceive that the power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had immediately been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. So here her situation was indeed desperate. She had been suffering from this flow of blood for 12 years. It is hard as a man to really comprehend this. I, 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 I can imagine, but I really can't even begin to comprehend can you imagine how much of a toll this would have taken out on her physically? Women in here have no problem understanding that toll. Her illness also took a toll on her financially. She had spent everything she had, her whole, whole livelihood on physicians, and none of them were able to help her. In fact, all that happened was that she got sicker and poorer. She would have suffered socially as well, not only from the the pain that she was suffering and the physical issues she would have had with losing all this blood. The Mosaic Law specified that a woman who suffered from, the, from such, we read for this in Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 15, in verses 25 through 27, Leviticus chapter 15, if a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, not as the time of her menstrual impurity, or if she has a discharge of, 
beyond the time of her impurity, all the days of the discharge, she shall continue in uncleanliness. And as, the, as in the days of her impurity, she shall be unclean. Every bed on which she lies, all the days of her discharge, she will be, be to her as the bed of her impurity. And everything on which she sits shall be unclean, as in the uncleanliness of her menstrual impurity. And whoever touches these things shall be unclean, and shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And this is pretty serious within the Jewish community. This woman not only had suffered from this, she would have suffered from all the consequences of Leviticus. The woman who approached Jesus at Capernaum had, had no remission of bleeding for 12 years. And so she was continually in a state of ceremonial uncleanliness. She was unclean. You, know what, you, you realize that that means she could not go to the synagogue. She could not go to the temple. She, she would be, she, because she would contaminate everybody and anything that she came in contact with. Even her association, imagine this ladies, that you could, not have, you could not have close contact with your own husband if this woman was married. She had to be cared for from a distance. And so she too must have heard about Jesus. And she has been suffering for as long as this young lady had been alive. And she believed that he could heal her only if, only if he could just touch her cloak. He doesn't even have to say anything to me. If I could just get to Jesus, if I could just come to Jesus, if I could just touch him. Christian, you know what Jesus has done for you and you don't even want to follow it. Let alone have the urgency just to, just to be near him. And yet, Christian, we have the word of God here. We have the instruction of God here. You have a, a place here at Grace Harvest where you can grow into faith. You know, a brother came to me this morning and says, Pastor, I, I, can I say something tomorrow night at the men's group? I said, sure, brother. What, what do you want to talk about? He said, I want to talk about our Sunday school program. He said, I was downstairs this morning, and I was the only one in the room beside who was teaching's family. He said, I, I've heard some of the best teaching I've ever heard in Sunday school right here at Grace Harvest. And nobody's taking advantage of it. And yet this woman, just let me, let, just let me touch this cup. Let me just touch it. Folks, is there a real desire in your heart to really know the one who saved you? Or, or, or is, this all a, is this all a show? Is this all a game? Where you, you, you claim the title of Christian... You put your Facebook posts, you wear your t-shirts, you say I'm a believer, but how does your life reflect it? How does your everyday life reflect it? Do you have the same faith as this woman? You see, she thought that all she had to do was touch it, and she did it, and she was healed immediately. Remember, Jesus didn't even know she did it at first. The disciples didn't see her. She grabbed it and she was healed. Could you imagine at that moment what that must have felt like to her? That moment when she knew that she was healed. She did and, and she was healed. And, and, and we know from Mark and Luke that Jesus asked, who touched him? Now, imagine you're one of the boys. And you're following along with Jesus. And you're going through this throng of people. And Jesus goes, who touched me? And you're like, are you kidding me? You, you're really asking, I, you, you, you know, you claim to be who you claim to be. You ought to know who touched you. But they had no clue. And, and they're like, what do we do here? You're, you're kidding, right? But then we're told in Luke 8, 47, we see that the woman responds. And when the woman saw that she was not, she was not hidden, she came trembling, that's what the Bible says, and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Her faith in what Christ could do healed her when he touched her, when she touched him. And I love this daughter, this affectionate term to her. She belonged to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords now. Do you know, ladies, this morning, you who know Christ as Savior, you are his daughters. You, will, you hear Jesus saying the same thing to you. 
Be at peace, my daughters. That's why I call you sisters in Christ. You are my sister. And you know what? You will be my sister in Christ forever. We're my own flesh and blood. If they don't accept Christ as Savior, they will not be my brothers and sisters in Christ forever. And see, we see another act of worship. First from Jairus, now from this woman. She worships God. And when we see God work, how do we respond? Do we worship? When your prayers are answered, do you worship? When the loss that you have been witness to get saved, do you worship? I love it on Sundays when we have a baptism here. And the waters have been still way too long. But that's God's providence. We preach. We proclaim. But I love it when I see somebody baptized here and I see people crying out there. You know who the ones are crying? The ones that prayed for their salvation. Because they're the ones that invested in them. They're the ones that have been on their knees. They're the ones that have been on their faces before the Lord some months, some years, and some decades. We had a man saved in this church. Many of you don't know who he was. He lived in this neighborhood. And he was probably in his 50s when he got saved and got baptized. You know what his testimony was? You know who he thanked? He thanked his grandmother who always prayed for him since the time he was born. Glory! And that brings us to the third and final group, the laughers. So we've talked about the leader. We talked about the lady. And now let's look at the laughers, the scoffers here. Jesus now continues to uh, Jairus' home. And arriving there, he finds a, a, quite a commotion going on. And because the professional mourners had already arrived. That may sound strange to us. Look at verse 23. And when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, Mark and Luke record the people as loudly weeping and wailing and lamenting. Understand that in Jewish custom, as in many other Near Eastern lands even today, the death of a person does not bring about quiet voices and somber music, but loud wailing and music. That can be described more than noise than anything else. You know, we in Western culture, we would be shocked by a funeral like this. We come to a viewing, we walk in, and they play funeral music. We all know the term, right? We, 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 when we hear music in an elevator, sometimes we say it sounds like funeral music. And it's all somber, and everybody's quiet. And we walk in, we greet the family, there may be a little bit of smiling and laughing, small laughter as we tell stories to one another about the deceased. And, and, but, but there's a somber, somberness about it. There, there is a respect that, that we do in our culture that they would consider disrespectful in theirs. See, they come and they, they make all this noise and the purpose was not to quiet the spirit and console it as we try to do, but to proclaim the agony of the loss. That's what they're doing. Jewish funerals involve three prescribed ways of expressing grief and lamentation. First was tearing one's garments. And we don't see Jairus doing since he was with Jesus and looking to Jesus to raise her from the dead. Remember, he goes to him thinking his daughter is near death. Then he finds out she is dead. When they come and say, your daughter's dead, don't bother Jesus anymore. And so it's the tearing of the garments they would do. Second, it's hiring a professional women mourners. You would go out and hire women. That's what they get paid to do. Can you imagine that? That's your what do I do for a living? Oh, I, I mourn professionally. Wow, I really want you to come to my house. I mean, that's what they did. They would not only wail the name of the one who just died, so they would wail out the name. So if... If I died, they'd be hollering, Mark, Mark. And then not only would they holler my name, they would holler everybody that my family knew that died. So if everybody gathered, they'd be going, and, and they'd call my dad's name, and my brother's name, and my daughter who died's name, and, and my mother's name. and my gra They would just start wailing all these names out so that your grief would be compounded. Not only are you worried about Mark dying, now you've got to bring up his daughter dying, and then you've got to bring up his dad dying. Oh, my goodness. And they would do that just to get everybody worked up into this state. And you can imagine how much this was. And then the third thing they would do after they hired the women, after they would tear their clothes, hire the women, they would hire professional musicians. Most commonly, they were flute players who would play loud, disturbing sounds meant to reflect the emotion of confusion and grief. And that must have sounded really nice. Matter of fact, 
Jewish records record that even a poor man whose wife had died should, to, should need to hire at least two flute players and one wailing woman. So even if you're poor, you're expected to have at least two flute players and one wailing woman. I, can't ima- I don't know what the going cost was. But obviously this guy, Jairus, was the leader of the temple, so he would have had a lot of money, so they would have already been counting on him spending a lot of money to mourn his, the loss of his daughter. And Jesus is having none of this, though. None of this mourning, none of this grief, none of this, this fake mourning, none of this loud music. And the first thing he does is do what? He dismisses these professional mourners. He said, go away. Go away, for this girl is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him. They laughed. And the word laugh carries the meaning of mocking and ridicule here. They were mocking Jesus. They're mocking him. One moment they're wailing, and the next moment they, uh, they're mocking. Jesus then exercised his power over death. And in verses 25 and 26 we read, But when the crowd had been put outside, he went and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. And the report of the, this went through all the district. Mark and Luke add that Jesus said to her, Child, arise. Child, arise. Jesus knew the girl was dead. Just as he knew Lazarus was dead when he said to his disciples, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go that I may awaken him out of sleep. See, as he explained to his disciples on that occasion with the death of Lazarus, his reference to sleep signified actual death, though it was temporary and not literal sleep. Same way Paul does when he writes in his epistle about saints asleep, have fallen asleep. See, Matthew is building his case that Jesus is the Messiah and presenting increasing proof of his authority over different things. Many people have scoffed and said that Jesus didn't raise this child from the dead. That it, it was, it was, it was, the child was just sick, it was in a coma, and then it, she happened to wake up. But it makes no sense for Matthew to include that in the story. We have seen the progression of how Matthew has identified Jesus as the Son of God by displaying what the Messiah would actually do. He heals sickness. Then he has control over nature. And then he has control over the supernatural. And then he has control to forgive sins when the paralegic walked. And now, at the very end of that, we see as the trail goes to raising the dead. The same thing he would do eventually to defeat death once and for all. So this is why the story is told here. This is why it's placed here. And, and Jesus has fulfilled all those things that people were wondering about the Messiah would do. The passage in Luke 8.55 specifically says, if those who doubt that she was dead, and her spirit returned, and she rose immediately. She was dead. And God raised her from the dead. And death, you see, is the separation of the spirit from the body, and here we find it returning to the body. When Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. He wasn't talking about his body being in paradise. Talking about his spirit. When you die... When we die, and folks, remember this, when you die before the rapture, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You will be with the Lord. There's no soul sleep. You're not going to be laying in a cemetery or sitting on your kid's mantelpiece somewhere in in an urn or thrown into the ocean like some people do. Don't worry about what happens to this body. Don't fret about what happens to this body. You know, some, some people ask me this. Pastor, it's all right if I get cremated. Of course it's all right if you get cremated. Well, I've had some people say, how is my resurrected body going to come? It's burned. I said, well, how's your resurrected body going to come if you got ate by worms 200 years ago when they used to put you in the ground in a pine box? How's that going to happen? Well, of course, don't worry about things like that because the Spirit is what God takes and He will give you a new body. He ain't giving you this same one. Praise, praise God for that, right? You get a new one. And so be separated from our spirit means we're separated. I mean, separated from our body means the Spirit is separated And so I just want you to understand, this was death. There was the separation, and Jesus brought her back to life. I've always wondered this. I can't wait to talk to this young girl and talk to Lazarus and say, how was it to come back? How was it to come back? Matthew concludes in verse 26, and the news went out into all the land, all the land. 
the news of Jesus' authority over death. It was spread throughout the country. They did not have Facebook. They did not have Instagram. They didn't take any pictures and send it out. Everybody's looking. It got spread by word of mouth. And it went, and it went, and it went, and it went. And the only conclusion that you can come from these stories that we've heard so far in the book of Matthew, that Jesus was God in human flesh. So I conclude today, and, and I, I make these closing comments. Jesus had conquered death, and he had provided a means for us to conquer it through him. I asked you to ponder something in the very beginning of the sermon. Canadian scientist J.B. Hardy once said in his examination of various religions with regard to the two questions, has anyone ever conquered death? And if so, did they make a way for me to conquer it? Two questions I asked you to ponder at the beginning of the sermon. He writes this, I checked the tomb of Buddha and it was occupied, and I checked the tomb of Confucius and it was occupied, and I checked the tomb of Muhammad and it was occupied, and I came to the tomb of Jesus and it was empty. And I said, there is one who conquered death, and I asked if, it a, if, if a way was made for me to do it, and I opened the Bible and discovered that Jesus said, because I live, you shall live also. John fourteen nineteen. Christian, you have no reason to fear death. Our living faith should put everything else that we fear at ease. And we can say with Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 55, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Death's power has been broken. Do you share that hope this morning? If you, if you do, rejoice and tell someone else about it this week. This is the week of Thanksgiving. And as you go to spend time with with friends and family, you're going to be spending time with people who don't know Christ as Savior. Are you going to hide it to yourself, or are you going to share it? But if you don't know Christ as Savior, if, you don't, if you're living right now in a state of hopelessness, that you've heard this all your life, but you just don't have the faith, I, I, I beg you to speak to me or one of the elders here. Be honest and, and just say, you're struggling. And I can pray for you. I can't convince you you're saved. I can't make you be saved. Only That's why we don't do that easy believism here. You don't hear me saying, just please repeat a prayer after me. That does you no good. Nowhere in Scripture it says invite Jesus in your heart. It doesn't say that. What it says is you make Him Lord and Savior of your life. You become transformed in Him. Jesus is the one that's defeated death once and for all. And we can say, say, just as we sung this morning, living he loved me, dying he saved me, bury he carried my sins far away, rising he justified freely forever, and one day he's coming, one day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. Father, what a glorious day that will be. But in the meantime, Father, I, I pray for your people here at Grace Harvest. I pray as I pray for myself, Father. I believe, help me in my unbelief. Help me, Father, where I fall short in my faith. Help these people, Father, where they fall short. Help us, Father, to understand that you are completely sovereign and our lives are in your hands. We don't live foolishly because of that, Lord. We, we live as good stewards of what you've given us and what you've asked us to do. And Father, I pray that you heal the hurting here this morning. Some of us may not be heal feeling um, sick, Lord, or, or suffering from uh, cancer or severe pain, Lord, but others are. Some of us are s suffering emotionally, Father. Some are depressed. Some are discouraged. Father, I, I pray that you give us the faith that we saw here today of Jairus and of this woman who bled for 12 years. Father, she, she, she trusted and her faith saved her. Lord, I know that our trust in you has saved us through what your son has done. Father, help us to be men and women of faith here this morning. Help us to stand for you when others would not stand. Give us courage when we need the courage, Father. I pray blessings upon your people here today, Lord. I pray that as we enter this week of Thanksgiving, Father, that the first thing we are thankful for is not the food on the table. Not the roof over our head or the clothes on our back or even the children and family we have, but our first thought is 
giving you thanks for the gift of eternal life you gave us through your Son. May that ever be so in our hearts. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Uh, just one thing, Pastor Kyle, before you come. Uh, we, have, we, we had these made up for uh, Chuck and Rachel. Um, Chuck is uh, going through and just finished his treatment for his cancer. And um, Kevin, who, who uh, is uh, in the process now of, for his cancer treatment, uh, we have bands out there.